All right. So, I think we're finally live via my iPhone because Facebook's uh, system is not doing very well. So, thank you to everybody for your patience and tuning in. And hopefully you can hear me because uh, I didn't test any audio on my phone. I tested it on the uh, on the laptop. So we are here and I'm here on behalf of Yamaha Champions Riding School. I'm going to be taking a bunch of questions from you guys. Um, a lot of you people have been signed up for Champ U, which is our online curriculum that I had the pleasure of being a part of. So uh, uh, thanks to everybody who signed up for Champ U as well. I uh, had a good chance to uh, deliver some some curriculum and some <clears throat> some stuff on there and now we want to take everybody's questions. So, um, you know, without further ado, you know, bring on some questions and uh, I'll start tackling them. I already see a couple coming through. So from uh, from Edge Cubic, big fan, uh, seen you around my stuff for a long time. You know, what's the uh, best way to continue learning trail breaking? And... <clears throat> For me, that uh, that question, continuing learning trail breaking, is uh, is something that you know if you've got the idea of it, what trail breaking is, is keeping the brakes on throughout the corner entry. So you go to the brakes when you're nervous, you pick that brake pressure up to slow your motorcycle, and you continue slowing your motorcycle into the corner. So you have brakes on past the turn into the corner. Really, that can be one percent of brakes. So the best way to think about it is that you don't have to be braking hard at lean angle for it to count as trail braking. So, um, you know, you can hold that just two or 3% of brake pressure on corner entry and, and that'll give you more opportunity to keep practicing. So, <clears throat> um, the next question is, am I switching to BMW? Uh, not technique question that, uh, we've been, uh, that we've been, teed up for but uh nothing is nothing is completely uh set in stone yet for next year i want to try a couple different brands of motorcycle but uh we have announced and are certainly done with the ducati superbike so um i'm gonna ride a couple other brands over the next uh, couple weeks and try to make a decision by the end of october on what we're going to do for next year um street riding has been great I've got my uh, my Harley Davidson Road Glide Special that I that I got from Harley this year, and um, honestly, that's for me street riding. I uh, I love riding Harley on the street. You know, I'm not uh, on the street to try to uh, push too hard. I always leave a lot out there on the street, and um, plenty of storage in the bags on the Harley for uh, going to, going to the grocery store. So it's uh, yeah, it's been good all the same techniques, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's a sport bike or a cruiser or what it is. So, um, <clears throat> a few more questions coming in here. Hi, Doreen. Um, so I saw a couple up here. Oh yeah. Everybody just wants to know what I thought of the BMW. So let's see. Yeah, comparisons between Yamaha, Ducati, and BMW. Um, let's talk about what corners and situations do you use rear brake with on track? Um, for me, I use uh, – depends on, on the racetrack for sure. If there's a lot of left-handed corners, I can get to my foot brake pretty easily. And then I also have a thumb brake on the left hand. And I'll use the, the thumb brake for mid-corner to tighten up the line without having to go to the front brake and transfer – transfer weight to the front tire or I'll use it as like a, a wheelie control in case uh you know come off the corner trying to fight the front end from coming up helps to uh just keep that that front end under control um you know I first got involved with Yamaha Champion School back in 2014 I can't believe it's been almost 10 years um when the school was restarted and moved to Jersey and I was at the 
first school that they had in this current ownership group at New Jersey Motorsports Park, and I've been there ever since. So, um, yeah, I just got uh, just wanted to find a way to get on a, a motorcycle more, and I always wanted to to uh, do some coaching and give back to the sport. So, um, been doing that ever since. Ha- haven't made it to as many schools as I used to. Just been too busy with racing, but. Um, Let's see, from Edgar, elbow down, definitely looks cool in the pictures, but does it have advantages? Jonathan Ray himself doesn't do it, but he says he's trying to adapt his style. What are your thoughts about it? So we're definitely seeing a shift in riding technique in World Superbike, more toward MotoGP style with with guys fully hung off. And I think the biggest thing to take away from you know how far to hang off your motorcycle is that there's a time and place where you're fully hung off versus where you're not so no matter what uh, series you're looking at on corner entry on the entry to the corner in MotoGP Marquez Quattararo any of those guys at the front there's they're not fully hung off on corner entry their upper body's more in the center of the bike their butts off to the inside and everything's set up and ready but it's not until the full mid corner and exit of the corner that you see their bodies actually fully hung off. And, you know, we're seeing Johnny Ray adapt to uh, that style a little bit to try to, uh, to try to keep up with top rack who's putting the pressure on these days. So, you know, what you're seeing is, you know, Johnny trying to find more mid corner speed and get his, his weight a little bit lower in the middle of the corner to, uh, to try to generate some grip because it looks like he's struggling with the edge grip on that Kawasaki this year, at least compared to the Yamaha, which seems to be at another level right now. So those are some, uh, some quick thoughts on the body position and elbow dragging and, and all that stuff. New to track. Would you suggest local track days or the Yamaha school? I know I have bad habits. I need to overcome. Well, the answer is going to be probably pretty expected, but the earlier you can come to us and, and get some technique, the better you're going to be because we can give you all the same techniques. There's no levels to our school um, or sign up for champ U and start doing the online program. So you can, uh, so you can see stuff, you know, before you go to the track, it's only 99 bucks. You can get our whole curriculum for eternity. So that is um, somewhere to start. If you come to Yamaha school, we're going to take good care of you. Whether you've never seen the clutch before or you're trying to qualify for your first Moto America race, we take students of all skill levels and um, really getting you off on the on the right foot, riding the bike the way it's designed to be ridden. So that's my thoughts there, Matt. On the trail breaking front, what are sensa- what sensations should be happening as I'm learning to carry more brake pressure deeper into the corner? That's a great question Um, because we're all trying to search for where the limit of of grip is, especially in the front tire. Rear tire is a little bit easier, but the front tire, it's hard to know how much you really have, you know, have available. So I think the biggest thing about getting feel is that you can be light on your hands when you're braking. Now, hard braking, you're going to take a lot of load through the hands, but when you're trail braking into into the corner, there's not not as much braking force. If your lower body is uh, has built a good foundation, your hands are light, you can feel more of what's happening with the front tire. So as you're breaking into the corner, you know, you're going to feel, you can feel the, the front tire moving and squishing, and you can feel the bumps come through the tire, through the forks, into your hands. Those are the sensations you want to try to to search for, and you're never going to get those sensations if the brakes are off. So that's something that's really important to think about is, you know, the reason that we trail brake is so that we can maximize squishing the tire against the pavement. And what that does is gives us more feedback. So that feedback is going to be, is going to tell you, and usually feedback tells you that there is grip, not necessarily that there isn't, you know, so that's kind of the the feeling you're going to get from it. But you know, when you're starting to lose grip, if it's an overloaded tire, you're going to feel the front start to 
pump and kind of chop against the asphalt. Or if you're off the brakes, you know, you're going to feel the thing start to, to steer in underneath and kind of knife the front. So, um, you know, those are, those are good, good points of feedback there. All right. What's next? Good question again. What did the bagger force you to do differently in terms of technique than the Ducati? Well, that's a great question. It's, um, there's definitely a little bit of style differences between running a super bike versus racing a road glide bagger. And, um, the biggest thing is that the bagger is so heavy that, you know, you've got to, uh, go to the brakes early and you, you break pretty hard, but, um, you know, if you, if you get in too deep somewhere, you've got so much weight and inertia pushing into the corner that you're not going to have as much ability to adjust and, and pull more brake pressure if you need it. So, um, you know, being able to, you know, dial in braking markers and not go past them was such a huge thing. Um, honestly, there's not that much that's different, especially from like a body position standpoint. Um, you know, we're just trying to, you know, run around with the least amount of lean angle possible, especially on that bagger because the ground clearance isn't that good. Um, it got a lot better throughout the season. I think we, we ended up maxing our lean angle at Laguna Seca with 56 degrees on a Harley road glide, obviously a heavily modified Harley Davidson road glide, but, um, but no, and of course there's, there's no trash control and there's almost uh, 180 foot pounds of torque. So you got to be super careful on the, uh, on the exit of the corner, not to spin up, spin up the rear tire because these things are seriously powerful. Um, when is the right time to switch to slick tires? That's a good question as well. So what I think is uh, really important to understand about running like a track day specific tire versus going to slicks is that slicks are going to be a lot smaller window of operating range and temperature that you can run them in. And that's why you have to use tire warmers and you have to monitor your tire pressures really closely. So if you, um, if you want to go to the, the point to go to slicks would be that you've got great technique and you're looking for like literally the last two or three seconds that it's going to take for you to get to uh, the next group, or really you would already be in the top track day group. If you're considering going slicks myself and a lot of the instructors can ride with any a group, you know, level three group, in the country on Q3 pluses. So on any bike, on a, on a MT10 or, you know, an R6 or whatever it is. So, um, I think it's just realizing that, you know, you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of ceiling and I personally love going out and riding on Q3s cause I don't have to worry about warmers. They heat up really quickly. There's so much, uh, versatility in that tire. So it's a great question. All right, let's find the next one here. Yeah, and some added added stuff there. Talk with your track tire supplier. Yeah, slicks are amazing, but if you don't have the pace to keep them warm, you can actually end up with less grip than a track day or even a street tire. So you've got to you got to operate in that narrow range, and it just takes a lot more. Uh, attention and upkeep throughout the day. Watch it. Road America. You got to be talking about the bagger entry to turn eight. Yeah. All right. As a pro racer, all you guys are fast as flip compared to us track club racers during my last private day. Oh, wow. This is a long one. Okay. During my last private day, in an expert group, a guy who I thought would have been getting on the gas, hanging off at max lean angle, picking up the bike, his bike, either at a failure TC kick in, or just got off the throttle. I was maybe a foot off his rear tire and had to avoid him in a high speed turn. I fixed on his exhaust, trying to look through the turn and hit his exhaust with my elbow. And then I put a lot of input into the bars and got yoked off. My question, 
is how you keep calm and fix yourself without colliding when you're on someone's ass or inches from their body or bike. Well, yeah, riding close around other riders. I can tell you, I just did a track day Sunday at Fontana on that BMW. And, you know, for people I'm not comfortable being around, I got to give that extra space. And the idea behind that is, yes, it might be their fault because they didn't pick up the throttle. They did something weird. They swerved across the track. They didn't signal when they were going to pit in. You know, whatever the drama is of that rider in front of you, it's still your responsibility to to take care of yourself in those situations, right? So give those people the extra room and know that, you know, which direction they're going to go if they have an issue. You know, your trajectory going into the corner, if they have a problem, they're going to end up going wide, right? So, um, yeah, you know, you can, you can be in the dirt and both of you guys are crashed and and, you know, looking at your damaged motorcycles and say, well, he didn't, you know, he had a problem, but that problem can be, can be nothing if you, uh, if you put yourself in a position to avoid it really quickly. So, um, you know, in, in, with us racing in Moto America, you know, 95% of the guys we're out there with, you know, you kind of, you can trust each other, you know, you know, everybody's pretty predictable especially in Superbike, you know, we literally just lean on each other in corners and, and know that we can get away with it. So um, that's that's a different deal. But, you know, when I go to the 200, Daytona 200, obviously big drama there with back markers that are quite a ways off the pace, things like that. So, all right, let's see. How much do you use your thighs when breaking into a corner? I always tend to have very sore arms after a track day. Is this normal? It is common. Um, the first thing I would say is you're probably in the middle of the seat. Based on the way you voiced your question here, um, being that, you know, I use one thigh for support going into the corner. When my butt is to the inside, my outside thigh is up against the fuel tank and I have tank grips and the majority of my body weight is blocked by the backside of the fuel tank. Now, there is, of course, going to be weight in your hands as well because you have all this mass above the fuel tank that has to go somewhere. So you still have to take a load on your hands in the heavy braking zone. But if you're in the middle of the seat, you pretty much have to take all of it. You have nothing bracing you against the tank. You're in the middle of the seat. You're trying to squeeze your legs on the tank. Nobody good's doing that in MotoGP, right? They all have their inside leg out, leg dangle into the corner, their butts to the inside. Everybody's got custom tank shapes now to, to fit exactly how they sit on the bike. So their outside leg has a, has a stop up against the back of the fuel tank. So something to really think about, especially getting tank grips, because that's such a huge deal for me. Like that's the first thing I do to any bike I want to ride. If it comes straight off the showroom and I'm going to go ride it on track, I'm not going to do tires first. I'm not going to do, I'm not even going to take the mirrors off first. The first thing I'm going to do is put tank grips on the bike. So that's how important they are to me. All right, who's next here? Okay, my question is, after many years of riding, I can see myself stuck in front of a big wall, can't go any faster. I feel like if I go faster, I'll crash or make a huge mistake. What's your words to pass that level to go next fun level? Please help me. It is such a common question. And usually what we see is people trying to make up time where there's not time to be made, where it's, you know, I got to, obviously I need to brake harder and later and I need to get on the gas earlier. It's not, it's not that simple. It's about maximizing the exits of the corners. And most people who are stuck at a plateau are too fast in the middle of the corner. They're trying to carry mid corner speed, trying to keep their knee down for longer trying to make it feel fast where most of the guys in the advanced group at a track day are going to be way too fast mid corner, like going to a track day and riding around a lot of people or even back to the example of the Daytona 200, you know, we're lapping people on lap seven of a 57 lap race and 
half those back markers are faster than us, the lead group, in the middle of the corner. But we're way faster off the corner because we respect the middle of the corner, get the bike pointed, and are the first back to wide open throttle, not the first back to the throttle. We're first back to wide open throttle, not necessarily the first back to the throttle. A lot of plateauing parts, a lot of a lot of plateaus reach that way with riders getting stuck, hitting a wall, can't figure out how to go faster, keep throwing new tires at it, but not necessarily finding that pace or finding that next level. So I hope that helps. But really got to get with an instructor to see where you're you know, where you're, where those points are. All right. Brian had a bad accident summer of 2020. How do you guys get over that and get back up to speed so quickly? I've been struggling with confidence and comfort ever since, and it hurts enjoyment on the bike as well as lap times. You're not alone, Brian. It's a, uh, it's such a difficult thing to, uh, to lay in the dirt and, and realize what happened or be hurt and in the hospital, all busted up. I've been there a few times, um, you know, for, for us, obviously it's our job to go get back racing, but there's certainly a perspective that allows us to get back on the bike that quick and, and go right back as fast as we were when we jumped off of it in the first place. Um, it's just understanding that, you know, what you're doing on the motorcycle is so, highly technical you know there's literally a moment you go to the brakes not a feeling or a luck or you know some other energy that is making you have a good day or a bad day at the track it's just about you and your motorcycle and you giving the right signals to the bike so Knowing what you did when you crash is a, is a huge help because you can say, well, don't do that again, right? I just, I had too much brake pressure going into the corner. My head was a little high and uh, the cold, a little bit of a cold tire on the right side of the tire. There's, you know, whatever went into that, that, uh, that accident, you know, you can usually quantify it and be able to move on. But the thing about this sport is it sucks when you fall down. So, um, you know, the highs can't be as high if the lows aren't very low. And uh, I've had a few examples of that over my career with the big elbow injury this year and having to come back and and win the race at Laguna Seca on the bagger to, to get the championship and, you know, fighting, you know, still battling through this injury throughout the rest of the year. So there's, um, yeah, it's just being able to take a technical approach on that and not get too emotional about what's happened and try to separate your emotions from the, uh, from the inputs you're going to put into the bike. All right. Another good question from Bradley Dodds at your level with those bikes. Do you find yourself having to intentionally counter steer or just drop in the head and foot on the peg? There is some deliberate counter steering happening for sure in faster sections where the throttles open on the bike, like the last section at New Jersey, where we're accelerating up, shifting through the gears and trying to get through these S's big push pull on the bars, but everything else on corner entry from a counter steering perspective is pretty subconscious. Something that happens naturally that we learn when we're, you know, riding a bicycle for the first time as a kid, it's something that, you know, gets picked up naturally and that carries on throughout whatever we ride. So, um, I don't really think about counter steering consciously. Um, it's just something that, you know, there's going to be big moments where you need it at certain racetracks, but, um, it's a pretty subconscious deal. Um, but the faster the bike needs to change direction, probably the more input you're going to have to put into the handlebars. I will be at Homestead in January. That's what I was asking. All right. There are so many questions. Here's a good one. Okay. Do you see anything in Jake Gagne's riding style or technique that is special or different from what others at the front of Moto America Superbike? Um, this is a good question. 
obviously riding around Jake for a lot of years. Um, we had a lot of battles in 2019 when I was on, I was the first year on my Ducati and he was on the Shivey BMW. So we spent a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time battling the Shivey BMW the last three years, whether it was Danny Eslick on it, Jake Gagne on it, uh, then Heron and now, uh, Hector Barbara. Um, it's kind of the level of the bike and kind of where I end up finding myself week after week. And Jake's technique hasn't necessarily changed that much. I mean, I think that he's, you know, doing things smoother this year and that's getting him a lot closer to the front, but it's a whole package deal. You know, the crew and him working with the crew to, you know, match the inputs of the bike to the electronics and the chassis. It's a whole package. Um, you know, Jake, he's so dialed in with his bike. He's so confident and calm and just not worried riding so free and, and loose that, um, yeah, he's just putting it down. Um, and you know, what you see at, in these races, it's such little margins between, you know, the front and the mid pack. You know, when you talk about just lap times on a, you know, a 20 corner racetrack, it's, you know, 0.7 a lap or 0.8 a lap slower to, you know, from first to fifth. And it's such a small margin when you look at it over, uh, you know, over one lap, but um, it's to get that last 2% of pace is it takes 98% of the effort to get that last little bit. And he's obviously dialed in and, and making it happen. So I'm happy for him. All right. How much, how helpful are airbags in preventing injuries? I had a bad high side a couple months ago where I broke my collarbone and can't get out of my mind. This question of an airbag have really helped. Yeah, I think it really would have. I wear Alpine stars tech air. Um, we've even got the, uh, the hip airbags now in, uh, in some of our custom stuff that's coming down. And, um, I still have all the bro bones I've broken in 20 surgeries I've had, I've not done a collarbone and I feel like, um, I feel fortunate to have made it to airbag suits without doing the collarbone, because I think that's the number one thing that they can help, uh, prevent because the way it inflates around your shoulders, it keeps everything really structurally, uh, together. And the collarbone gets done when you land on your shoulder and the shoulder compresses and you break the collarbone here. So it keeps your shoulders held in place. And I think probably would have, you know, never know, but, uh, probably would have, uh, helped, helped, uh, mitigate that injury for sure. All right. Scrolling down, scrolling down. couple of these I answered. <laughs> Doreen wants to know if I ride a super hooligan hyper motard 950. <laughs> it would be fun for sure, but with baggers and super bike, I'm probably going to be pretty busy, but I still want to ride it. So I need to come up there and ride it. All right. What do we got next? Definitely recommend a, a school before track days if you have the option. <laughs> what is the adv what advice would you give someone wanting to learn how to back it in? Uh, it's a byproduct of speed much more than it is a specific technique that is practiced. So the biggest thing I would say if you want to try to learn it is be very, very dialed in with your clutch lever and the friction point of the clutch plates. Whether you have a slipper clutch or not, that is how you manage a back it in situation where the bike is sideways on corner entry. It is much more about engine braking and allowing the clutch plates to come back together in a certain fashion than it is about rear brake or much else. All right, scrolling, scrolling. A lot of people watching. Dig it. Am I coming to Buttonwillow next week? I am not. 
I'm sorry. I will not be at Button Willow. Second question. How do you understand the front and rear shock suspension? I have run some good lap times and had JJ from Graves set up a sag for me after my best lap. I end up running the same way as before the new setup. I'm not to quite understanding how shocks and suspension work. Please help me. Thanks. Uh, it's not going to be the silver bullet. I mean, that is in that is in that, you know, upper 2% of, you know, pace. Like, for example, you know, Sunday when I rode that BMW at Fontana, I, we never talked, touched the bike settings wise, suspension really just, you know, getting the spring reads correct for my brake pressure and my pace. Now, specifically, I have purposely not said getting the springs and suspension set up for my weight because that is not something that is useful is setting up a bike for the rider weight. I could have a rider who is three times as heavy as me ride around 20 seconds slower than me and I will use twice as much suspension travel as them even though I weigh 150 pounds. So spring rates and suspension are far more determined by your pace and how you are actually loading the bike with brakes and throttle than it does the weight of the rider. So Kyle, if you would meet your younger self that is just starting to learn motor motorcycle racing, what would you say to yourself that you should really learn first and put a high focus on for early progress? I would say that for me coming from professional flat track racing to road racing when I was 18 years old, um, the biggest thing I would say is that there is, that's a really good question. What would I tell myself to progress quicker at that age? Um, honestly, I would say what I say to a lot of students is, you know, corner speed is not everything, you know, and lean angle is not how you get pace. I remember my first novice road race at Roebling on a 600 Suzuki and I finished like 11th out of a grid of 40. And, uh, I remember coming in and telling my dad that that was it. Like that's as, that's as fast as this bike will go. That's as fast as like we can get around this racetrack. And I finished 11th in a novice club race. Um, I remember being, you know, telling my dad I'm leaned over as far as I can lean over. I'm going to the throttle as early as possible. In fact, I'm picking up the throttle way earlier than people around me. So that's as fast as I can go. And, uh, I was so wrong, so insanely wrong that, uh, you know, that's, that's something I would tell myself sooner that, um, you know, respect the middle of the corner, be leaned over for as little time as you need and get back to the throttle, get back to wide open throttle as soon as you can. Let's see. Favorite track is Road America in Wisconsin. Favorite corner, man. Um, I've been asked this before. My favorite corner is at Road Atlanta. And it's not really a corner, but it's uh, turn nine at Road Atlanta, which is flat out, leaned over 190 mile an hour on a super bike before you come down into uh, the ten turn 10 braking zone. So that's probably the most fun. All right. Andy Toledo, what's the best way to get over the fear of picking up more speed and later braking? Um, I fear later braking as well because I'm more worried about where I'm letting go of the brakes and where I'm going to the brakes. It's way more important where you let go of the brake lever than where you're actually going to the brakes. And later braking really can mostly just lead to you rushing the, the corner entry if you're too late. And uh, going fast is all about exits. So you can go faster and safer at the same time. 
All right, what else we got here? Yes, Road America, looking forward to the repave in 2023. Will you be the next in line since Scott Russell to race a Harley Davidson in the Daytona 200? Uh, that's a great question. We've got to uh, convince Harley to make a bike that can compete in the 200. But, uh, but yeah, it looks like we're, uh, we're pretty much out of time. So uh, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for jumping on and asking questions. Um, this, this video will be posted for watching again, if you're just joining us, um, and we'll make sure that, uh, that everybody, uh, gets a chance to, uh, to see what we've got to say. So, um, if you haven't check out champ U, uh, it's our online program. You can check that out. It's 99 bucks at the moment and you get to have our entire school program in online videos with quizzes and, um, you can watch it as as many times as you need and you have access for eternity if you buy in so uh um, from there uh sign up for yamaha champions riding school i'll be at quite a bit of the uh the schools coming up i think we're going to come out with our 2022 schedule very shortly and uh appreciate you guys we'll uh, talk to everyone soon thanks for tuning in